I want to welcome everyone tonight to this wonderful opportunity to see a great documentary film. Uh, my name is Deirdre Boyle. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Media Studies and Film here at the New School and director of our graduate certificate in documentary studies. Um, I am welcoming you on behalf of the Department of Media Studies and Film and the Institute for Retired Professionals, which are collaborating tonight to bring this program to you. Um, and I want to, in particular, thank Pam Tillis, who is the mastermind behind this event. Were it not for Pam's having seen Darius Martyr's film, Loot, at the IFC in December, uh, we wouldn't all be here today. And it was Pam's um, enthusiasm for the film and recognition that this would have a life here, particularly for our constituency, that um, we have um, this event to be grateful for. So um, uh, I don't want to take a lot of time um, in introducing um, the film and Darius, but I'll just say one or two things and then bring Darius up here so that you can meet him. Uh, the plan is um, at the end of the screening, which is about 84 minutes long, we will have a Q&A. And Darius and I will talk for a little bit and then open the mic for your questions and comments, which I'm sure there will be plenty. Um, and I think uh, if you've never been in this space before, just so that you know, for comfort's sake, there is a men's room and a ladies' room in the back on the left-hand side over there, just in case you are wandering around when the lights go down. Um, <clears throat> I, too, had an opportunity to see Loot because of Pam when she invited me to consider being the host for this event. And I was really uh, struck by the complexity of this subject matter. As you know from having picked up the program notes, this is a film about a search. Whether or not it is a search for buried treasure, um, well, it is a search for buried treasure, but what that buried treasure is is probably something you will decide along the way as you're watching this film. Um, I think uh, I don't want to say a whole lot more, and I don't know how much more Darius would like to say, but I want to invite Darius Martyr up here to say hello and um, add anything you might like. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre, and thank you, Pam. And thanks for being here. No, I don't want to say anything else other than thank you. And I really look forward to talking to you after. There's really nothing to say now, but other than welcome and thank you. If we were in France, this is the point where we would wish you a good projection. I love that expression. And so we can all hope for a good projection. Let me just say, though, one more thing, that you are really in the hands of a master here in the film that Darius has uh, made. This has won awards. It has been shown on HBO. It was included at the IFC. It won the Best Documentary Award at the Los Angeles Film Festival back in 2008. So it comes to you with many uh, prestigious attachments, and we are just the, the last in the line of very satisfied customers watching this film tonight. I'm going to begin with a couple of questions of my own for Darius and some comments, and then turn it over to the rest of the audience. So um, thank you so much. This is the second time I've seen it, and it's more wonderful than I remembered, so thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, my first question is how you became interested in this. How did you meet Lance and Daryl and Andrew? Well, that's kind of an involved story. I, I, was, I was just about to have my second kid, and I was very in the process of trying to make films and make a film, but I, didn't, I hadn't made a feature yet, and I was trying to teach myself to edit on, you know, making wedding videos, and you know, I was cooking and doing, uh, doing all this stuff. I was a chef in, in the city here, a personal chef, and I, I one day talked to my wife and quit everything. I decided it was just time to quit everything. And about a week after I quit everything in order to finally make films, I was sitting in Prospect Park watching my son in the sandbox, and um, a man came and sat down next to me, and he was from Utah. And 
he asked me what I did, and I, I said I was a filmmaker, because that's what I was doing. I, it was a short career at that point, but... <laughs> um, and, and he said, you know, I've always thought this would be a great story, and he starts describing this used car salesman, friend of his from Utah, uh, Lance. And he says, it, you know, he goes on this long, wonderful story. This guy's name is Dan Campbell. He lives in Park Slope. And he goes on this long story about how he was traveling with Lance and looking for antiques. Um, you know, it's Lance. He does everything. And looking for antiques, and Lance mentions, he's like, you know, I know this house. We should stop by in Austria. There's jewels in an attic, you know. And so Dan kind of you know, said, well, well, really? And and he said, you know, I've always been thinking about this. It would be a great story. And I just said, yep. And uh, and we flew out like three days later. And he said, he said, well, how about I'll produce it? And and uh, he said, what does that mean? You know, I said, well, I think it means you pay for it. He's like, okay, that sounds great. He says, have you made anything? Have you made a film? I was like, no. He's like, okay, it sounds great. <laughs> sounds perfect. So... We did. We flew right out there. He bought equipment, and I, I, you know, I have to give a lot of props to Dan. I mean, he knew, of course, how lucrative the documentary film market is. So <laughs> it, it wasn't like it wasn't an uncalculated decision on his part. I, I've heard of the Angel Moroni, but not the Angel Dan. This is the Angel. This Dan. is the Angel Dan of yeah. documentary. Yeah, it was wonderful. I mean, it, and and that began it, and. We flew out there, and we met Lance, and we didn't call Daryl. Daryl, you know, we just thought, let's see. Let's see if this can happen. And uh, first trip out, I didn't meet Daryl. Then I met Daryl. And then a month after we were shooting or so, we were actually at Daryl's. Daryl's the man in the field in the end. We were at his house. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, at, his, at the man who he stole the jewels with's house in Montana. And we're flying back from Montana. And Lance says, what are you guys doing this weekend? And I said, uh, I don't know. What are you doing? And, and he said, no, I'm going down to Arizona. You know, there's this, there's this guy. You know, he's got another, he's got another, uh, he's got another treasure, you know, from World War II, you know. And, it, and we're like, Lance, he's like, you, you want to come? We're like, yeah, we really do. That sounds great. <laughs> so, and that's how we heard about Andy, the second man. Uh, it, it just came up that casually in conversation with Lance. When did you discover what the real subject of your film was? Well, that's a hard question to answer because, you know, the editing process is such a, a long and, you know, detailed process. I think, actually, very early on, I, I felt that, the, that this film was going to was going to resonate on a deep level. Obviously, I couldn't have known anything that was going to happen. But, you know, I had the, my, the very first interview with Daryl in his house was really the only interview I did with him where I, used, I sat down and kind of did an interview. And it was in that interview, it all, he spoke of all of this, his, his passion about SS troopers and how awful they were and his, you know, feelings about them, his, his son that died, he wept, and it was all there. And it was just, it was very clear. You know, it was very clear in that moment that, it, that this father-son thing was very important. It was just not clear how it was going to work. And I didn't know at that point that Lance had a son um, that was teetering and that Andy even existed, let alone had a son also that had died. So that just found, it, you know, found its way to mention you, the filmmaker, with your son in the sandbox. And my son in the sandbox, who I left right in the sandbox in order to go shoot the movie. No, I, yeah, my son, and, and, that, and I think that did bring a lot to it, that I'm a father myself. And Could you talk a little bit about the archival footage? I think some of it is and some of it isn't. All of it is, yeah. All of it is. Yeah. Could you talk about that, how you found it and how you decided to integrate it into the film? Yeah, that was actually a great process. Uh, I mean, a treasure hunt in its own way. You know, we, we, we drove down, my, my assistant Zeb and I, Zeb I met in a, working in a video store, and he just seemed like a, a neat guy. And so I asked him if he wanted to come by the office, and he came by, and he ended up being my assistant for three years. 
Um, and he, so we'd pack some sandwiches and drive down to Washington to the archives. And that's an incredible place if you've never been. Uh, you, know, you see, you pull this 35 millimeter film out and uh, you watch it. You, you, know, you just spin these reels of film of World War II and you're just blown away. You've never seen anything like it. And it's totally random. I and mean, you go through these card catalogs and you know, it's like GI brushes teeth. And then you look through this reel of film and it's, you know, unbelievably cinematic, incredibly powerful, disturbing, often disturbing footage, the kind of footage you just didn't know existed. Um, it was amazing. It was, it was amazing, amazing process. Uh, so a lot of the footage I found was so specific and consistent with the film it mirrored the film so exactly that I couldn't use it because it became almost self-conscious, you know, like it was too much. I found footage of a man, a GI in a Jeep with it, holding a gun to a Japanese prisoner's head as they're driving into the sunset, <laughs> beating him at times. Unbelievable. Very narrative also. The footage was very narrative. Uh, these were filmmakers shooting this. That was their contribution. So they were framing this. It wasn't a document so much as it was a... It was very cinematic, so much of it. Really amazing process. And if I understand correctly, it took you two years from the beginning, from the idea for the film, to completion. Right? No, it took three, three. Um, and longer in certain ways, but yeah, three from the very beginning to the... And uh, how much did you shoot? How much footage? How much time did you spend with Andrew and Lance and Daryl? I shot about 500 hours total, um, between four and 500, depending on how you count the archival and stuff, but a lot of time, a lot of time at Andy's house, if you can imagine. Um, that search through his house was, there were so many stories in his house that were so incredible, so many tangents one could go on. Newspaper clippings about his wife having been jailed for illegal abortions and you know you can't believe the surprising mm. things that came out of that house you know and it really it, that was such an intriguing and amazing and depressing thing to do <laughs> there must have been times when you weren't even sure your film was going to be a film yeah i mean it's not the kind of film that you know you know you know it's going to be a film i mean i had a very strong feeling about it from the beginning. Uh, there, was a, there was an energy in it that was hard to deny. But yeah, it was a dark process at times. Flying out for the 18th time to Arizona, mm -hmm. to this stinky house um, to, to, to shoot. Uh, you know, I, I had such a close relationship with both of these veterans, but it was, it was arduous, it was hard. It's a little ambiguous what ultimately happened to Andrew. Is that deliberate on your part? Do you want us not to know the details of his demise? Well, I, it, it is in the film that he, that he went to a home. And he went to a home. The irony is, is that he went to a home because he wouldn't pay his bills. And that's there. And I felt like that's all I really summed it up for him. I mean, he had the money in the safe, which was any guesses? How much? Hundreds of thousands it was, of dollars. Yeah, it was half a million dollars. And um, he wouldn't pay for air conditioning in his house. He wouldn't pay. And, and, it, and as the memories came, um, his will to survive lessened. Mm -hmm. It was really an, an extraordinary thing to witness. You might notice in the film that he wears the same shirt all the time. Yeah, he just, he didn't change his shirt from, he changed it, he, the first three shoots, he had different shirts on. And after that, same shirt, and he lost about 60 pounds. It was, it was heartbreaking. Didn't stop shaving, yeah. stop, it just, the will to live, um, the power of memories is just uh, unbelievable. And it had that feeling, you felt like, you know, memory is dangerous. You know, it, it's not easy to go there, you know. What his wife? His oh, wife. Hold on a second. I'm happy to um, have comments, but uh, take the microphone. Sorry. That's okay. Please. What happened, what happened to his wife? Because Here, you want my microphone? 
Yeah. Not the loud voice. What happened to his wife? <laughs> Again, what happened to his wife? So what was the what was the question? No. Um, we saw her several times, but then yeah. as he degenerated, she disappeared. Yeah, she did disappear, and it was a it was a subplot uh, storyline that I didn't feel. I could have. I mean, I did feel the movie was, needed one more depressing element. If I could just introduce one, something with some weight or heaviness to it toward the end, it would have been nice. No, her, she, she um, had Alzheimer's. And um, I have to say that was one of the most intense aspects of the whole thing was watching her. Because she, when I first met her, seemed you wouldn't necessarily know she had Alzheimer's. And as we filmed, it was as if a button was pressed, you know, and she just, she, it got so awful that, you know, I actually called um, social, services. social services because I couldn't in good conscience leave her there. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a way, as Andy went toward this, you know, everything around him just dissolved. And... Um, yeah, so it was very dangerous. I won't go into the details, but it was very dangerous. And I have incredibly heartwarming footage of Andy visiting her in the hospital and stuff, but it wasn't necessary. I, don't, I didn't think. Although, at times I really do, you know, everybody asks about his wife as well they should, and at times I regret not, ha not figuring out a way to show that. Um, but uh, there, it will be on the DVD extras. <laughs> How's that for a plug? <laughs> And it is going to be released soon, right? It is going to be released, yeah. <laughs> Boy, that'll get them there. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for a really very, very moving experience. Thank you. Um, I, I felt in watching uh, the lives unfold in this film that not only was I sharing in the pain and angst of, of their lives, but I was revisiting all of the pain and angst in my own life, mm. in my own experiences. So there was like a shadow of, of many lives going on in this film, which was a remarkable experience. And I loved the pace of the film. It was absolutely brilliant. Thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you. What an amazing comment, thank you. I'm sure there are other questions and comments, yes. He's going to give you the mic. <laughs> you mentioned that the actual shooting of the film took three years. And as part of a uh, remark that you made included in the film, you did say that you had spent a total of seven years on this venture. Lance said that, right. And... Uh, yeah, no, that's good listening. Um, Lance had mentioned that he had been looking for, you know, the, the used car salesman says he had been on this looking for treasure. He basically took up treasure hunting about seven years ago. So he mentions that he's been looking for these treasures for seven years. I, see. I wish I could have been with him for all of them, but I wasn't. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, the question is, was it spontaneous when Daryl went into the field? Um, absolutely, yeah. And it, it's a good, it's, uh, it's actually a really interesting thing to to look at what is spontaneous and what does that mean because it's the essence of what it means to document something or to be a documentary filmmaker. It was absolutely spontaneous in the moment, um, completely, it, but it was also connected to the conversation that Daryl and I had in the field that ushered him into the field. It wasn't as if he was asked, but as we spoke, the emotions rose and that's what let, you know, eventually, as you see, he says, I, I'm just going to walk out there. And he walks out, and I was filming him, and at one point, I turned the camera, and as I turned the camera, the SS, um, former SS soldier wa started walking. And that's often the way it works. Uh, I don't know if he would have walked had I not turned the camera, you know, 
Um, I know one thing is that he wanted to walk out there. Certainly, at no point in this film was anyone prodded. As a matter of fact, I would have thought it's saccharine, you know, like overly sweet even to think about. I would never have imagined, it's just like if you were writing a screenplay, you'd never think to write that because it's so absurd. You know, it's so ridiculous and, and, and yet incredible because it did happen at just like that. Um, you know, it was a longer process, uh, but yeah, unbelievable when he walked out there. It really was amazing. I wondered though if you um, had, because um, Daryl is miked at the beginning of that scene, um, if you had audio and you chose to suppress it so that this would be a silent moment of contemplation. Right, of yeah. Yeah, it, it really felt like um, that moment was for them. And it plays better, I think. I mean, it, it's, what they said was really wonderful. I mean, Daryl actually, he's just such a, he's always just pouring his heart out all the time. And Daryl, when he put his hand up on him, he said, <laughs> Like another something I wouldn't write. He said, God, I love you. <laughs> so no, I couldn't put that in the movie. Um, no, I mean, that's, it was the level, he said it absolutely from his heart. This was a, such a, a, a thing for him to be able to exercise all of that um, in that field. But yeah, I think it's better without audio. Yes. Uh, okay, so um, I wonder if, the subjects of your film, or yeah, ever saw the film? It seems that Daryl passed away before the film ended and Andy is sort of MIA. Right. And um, both of them are shown in extremely vulnerable moments in the hospital without any pants on, um, talking about very painful sort of perverse memories. And I just wonder how, you, how they might have reacted or how you feel ex showing those sorts of things. I don't know, it's very oh, vulnerable. So, so how you feel showing people exposed and vulnerable? Well, I guess I just wonder if, um, if you feel that they are comfortable with what you revealed about them. Well, it's important to also remember that this is what they revealed about them. Um, you know, it wasn't this, everything that, that they said, they said of their own, you know, free will, and they, they wanted to say this. And I wish Daryl had been able to see the film, because I think he would have just, I think he would have loved it. Um, you know, he, I think he would have really, um, would have meant a lot to him to see it. Andy never got to see the film. Uh, we weren't allowed to, we didn't know where Andy went. We didn't know what home he went to. They weren't allowed to divulge that information. So we never, I never saw Andy again. Um, and, uh, you know, Andy's story is much more, um, is much darker than Daryl's. And so um, the question of would he, would he have liked it, what would he have felt or thought, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that other than to say that we had an incredibly close relationship I had with Andy. And um, uh, this was a very important thing for him to be able to to talk about this stuff. I mean, it was very important. It was, as I said earlier, um, it was very painful, and, it, and that's an understatement. But he, um, when, we, when we came that last time, some people came who had visited him to help him out um, from social services, and they said that Andy had been describing to them an angel from New York who was visiting him. And it was, uh, it was amazing because they said they thought he was going crazy when he was, ex when he was describing this. And that they realized that this was this filmmaker who had been coming back and, and Lance. And uh, no, I don't, I feel, I feel very, I hope that the film doesn't feel like a violation at all. It, it didn't ever feel like that when I was filming and it never felt like that when I was editing. Yes? Okay, well, I'll let you ask that question again through the mic. Oh. Are you still in touch with Lance, and has he ever found anything? Um, yes, and no. Uh, 
No, I, I mean, it's pretty much a no as far as Lance. The thing about Lance is that, as you can see, he does find things. He, he's surprising. He's really, truly surprising. You cannot underestimate him. Uh, I know that there's some fun in the beginning of the film um, that, again, I don't feel as at all at his expense because that's Lance uh, through and through. But at his core, Lance, it really connects with something. He connects with people around him and he connects with things. So no, he didn't find riches and I don't think he, he you know, he, uh, once he found a gold bar or something actually underground. But the, here's the funny thing about Lance is that he was actually years before this, a couple years back before I met him, he had developed a neoprene sleeve that goes on mountain bike, like bars to protect a mountain bike and he made millions. He was a millionaire. That's how he funded that big hole in the, in the rainforest. And he lost it all. Um, so if, you've ever, if you ever see lizard skins, uh, which are mountain bike accessories, that's his invention. Yeah, but, well, you will, though. Now that I mention it, you'll look at a mountain bike while you're sitting and having a coffee and you go, oh, my God, that's Lance. Everywhere I went, he's like, hey, man, that's my part, you know. Um, so he's surprising. And, and he, 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 right now he's making glow-in-the-dark kids books, you know. Um, and I would not be at all surprised if he hits it out of the park with one of his inventions because that's just the way he is. But he just said to me the last time I saw him, which was recently, he said, he said, you know, man, I'm just so happy right where I am, you know, I'm just... I'm just doing my thing, and this is where it's at, you know. I'm coming up with inventions, and he is, and he's, he's happy. And I'll extend your question. How is his son doing? Well, that's not a simp there's not a simple answer to that. Um, I don't know how he's doing right now, but it's been up and down. It's been up and down. And Michael has seen the film and really likes it. Um, but... Uh, that, that's not, you know, that's not one of those things that has an easy fix, you know, it just doesn't. Sir, um, she's going to give you a mic. Did the Andy and Daryl ever knew about each other? They never knew. I mean, there, we, they were mentioned that there was another person, or Lance mentioned to both of them at times, like, I'm, I'm talking to another man, but no, they never knew each other and they never met and we didn't talk a lot about each other. Just going back to Lance for a second, what was his response to seeing the film? Lance was surprised at the film. You know, I think in Lance's mind, he always imagined this like, you know, like this kind of like treasure hunter and, you know, uh, you know, and this kind of exciting, maybe slightly reality show kind of thing. And it was so not that. So I think that really shocked him. And, and his response to me was, Am I, do I really talk that slow? <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think that was pretty alarming for him, that he was so lethargic seeming. Um, and I said, yes, Lance, I didn't slow that down <laughs> for effect. <laughs> um, but, he, and, and he's seen it a handful of times, and I think it was the third viewing that I think it really sunk in. I think he got past his own image, and, and, which is a hard thing to do, watching a film with you in it. It's very hard. I think he got past it, and it really hit him. And, uh, he talks to me endlessly about the film now. I think he loves it. The first reaction was hard, though, I think. Yes. Two questions. Uh, Lance seemed visibly disappointed at the end, in both cases, about not finding anything. So what was his actual reaction in both of those situations? And also, have you had a lot of response from World War II veterans who've seen this picture and who, while may not, they may not have buried something, but may have similar... Uh, similar stories or um, in some way be happy that this is all coming to light? Thanks. Um, in answer to the first part of the question about Lance, he, you, you mean the reaction when he came back and, and Andy's um, garage is, is, is cleaned out? Is that the first? And then the second is when they didn't find anything in the field after... Yeah. All, all three right. of that not, there's no there there. Right, right. Yeah, um, he rolls with the punches pretty well, Lance does, but the, there was a couple of moments of real, like, oh, you know. Um, 
with, with they were all different reactions. You know, the Philippines was, uh, had so many aspects to that trip because he had his old treasure hunting world and then he had the new search for Andy stuff and he felt really certain he could find something. I, you know, I didn't ever think that we could find anything in the Philippines. It was such a needle in a haystack. Um, and so his reaction was, in the Philippines, it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't a shock that we didn't find something. So there was no moment of real destitute, like, you know. Um, but, but, the, but Austria was different. Austria, when we didn't find anything in Austria, I think that hit kind of hard. And the next morning after we were in the field, Lance went, refused to acknowledge that the house had been torn down, that you see in the, he just couldn't, couldn't acknowledge. I have this nice scene, which isn't in the film, of him and Daryl, uh, standing in a doorway, and he's and he's like, D he's like, Daryl, I just got to go back, and, and I got to go through that house, and he, and Daryl's like, that's not the house that I put it. And he's like, I don't care, I got to go back, you know. So he actually went back the next day, and like the next morning before we flew out of there, and looked through the uh, the house and everything just to make sure, and uh, you know, he was disappointed. He was definitely disappointed, but he was also rocked by what happened, and I think he got it. I think he really got it after Austria. And the second part of your question? And the second part of the question um, was what again? I'm sorry. The World, II. the World War II vets. And, you know, not as many vet veterans have seen this film as I would like, you know, because, and there's not that many left. And, and that was another thing that you really witnessed in this film was just how this moment was not, this film couldn't have been shot a year later. You know, it was like the last moment. And um, I would love to, to, I have had some correspondences with veterans that have been amazing um, about it. You know, veterans that have wept after seeing it and, and this kind of silent, the silence around not just the war, but around the unspoken aspects of the war, the, the things that American soldiers don't say, you know, the, the things that, what happens to a generation that is called the greatest generation and what happens to those people when they don't feel great, you know. Um, and uh, I think that's hit pretty hard with some of them, some of the veterans I've seen. Um, I actually have several questions. The first one is, uh, speaking of, of Lance in the house in Austria when, when he went back, everybody in, well, in both places, the Philippines and Austria seemed, you know, very friendly and, and very helpful. And this woman who owned this house was perfectly fine with some strange man coming and rifling through her home. Yeah, um, you mean the, uh, the the house that I just said Lance went back to the following yeah. day? Yeah, that house actually that he went back to was vacant. Oh, okay. So, so no, there wasn't any home to be rifled through. It was it was empty, which actually made it cinematically very beautiful because it was very clear there was nothing in there. Okay. Um, um, so who was the woman who was? The woman that was there was the other neighbor. She was in the house next door, and she was the one who had the house, the picture of the old house, mm -hmm. and that was very clearly okay. the picture of the house where he had put the jewels. Okay. And as far as Andy goes, did he have any other children other than his son who died? Yes, he did. And I met, I met his daughter at one point, um, and uh, um, we act I actually have some nice footage of him with his daughter. Yeah. And I have one last, one last sure. question about Andy. When you were saying before that through the process you could, you could physically, you know, you could see Andy sort of lose his will to live and um, you stepped in and called social services for his wife and I was right. just wondering, between you and Lance, was, was it ever discussed, did either of you ever think about possibly backing off or telling Andy, or mentioning to Andy to maybe back off from the search due to what it was doing to him? Well, it wasn't, it didn't feel like that. I mean, it, it's kind of hard to explain. It didn't, it, it wasn't like we felt like we are visiting them, therefore they are, or, or especially, it didn't ever feel like this with Daryl, by the way. It never felt like he, this was hurting him. He wanted this so badly. As a matter of fact, he would say over and over again, he was like, I can't believe my luck. I mean, this is, I don't know what kind of film you're going to have, but I can't believe my luck, you know. He was just so pleased to have this opportunity. Um, and Andy was so pleased every time we would come, you know. He always wanted us there, and he would, you know, always invite us to sleep there, and, you know, and everything. And it, it just didn't feel like that, you know. It, it was, everything was, um, everything happened very naturally. And uh, it was as if you were going to visit a grandfather or something. And it, it's, it, was, it was just very clear 
over the course, as you looked at the whole, it was very clear what was going on and what was happening. Um, it was also important to understand that with Andy, um, the very dark, Nate, all of the very dark material that came out, and it came out in, it, it, a lot of it came out, it came out from the beginning. It wanted to come out. It was very clear from the very first interview that something wanted to come out. He would say it over and over and over again. He would say, there's something that wants to be said and I can't say it, you know, and, and but he would just, he wanted that. He wanted to exercise that. And so it was never, it never felt like that. Yes, uh, he has the mic. Oh, me again. Um, this is, I, I'm a little loath to ask you this. It's not a pleasant question, but it did, did it ever occur to you what Lance might have done when they found the money, had you not been there? Had it just been him and Andy? Oh, absolutely. Well, I talked to Lance about that. You yeah, know, I mean, absolutely. Because you know what Lance said Andy to me didn't after? seem to give a shit about the money. Yeah, you he know? didn't. And, and Lance's eyes bugged out. And it was hard not to bug, you know, have yeah, your eyes bug yeah. out. Yeah, so it, but um, it did occur to you, because I couldn't help but think about that. Yeah, the camera was a good thing to have, I think, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I don't, it's not like I would say that Lance would have taken any money. Um, it's not in his nature. Um, it's, it, it was so much money and, and a man that didn't care about it in that way that we had that conversation and Lance, and Lance said to me after, he's like, you know, I feel like I passed a test. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we always, yeah, we talked a lot about it. I have it on tape actually. And we, we, you know, we always joked about how hard it was to scrounge up the money for this film and, you know, here the, here's this chunk of money. And we knew it was going to go, it was going to get lost. And we don't know what happened to it. It was just, and we, I, we tried so hard to get Andy to put that in a bank. We bought a new safe for him and, you know, we, we tried so hard. But he didn't trust the banks. Very, he's tip, you know, just typifies his generation or, or some parts of his generation who from the depression just did not trust the banks and uh, he wasn't going to do it and I know probably what happened is when they took his house over the, you know well there might have been one happy little small town sheriff I don't know I don't know what happened well what about the daughter you know this is a tricky area for a filmmaker like how, how, no, it really is. How, how much do you get involved? Yeah, it's very hard. And the money made me extremely nervous. I wanted it gone. I, I would have been so happy if he could have willed that all to his daughter or done something with it. That it just, I, I hated it being there so much. It was just, it, it really, it really weighed on me. Um, I don't know if his daughter knew about the money. I didn't have his daughter's contact information or any, I wish I had. We talked about this endlessly, like, God, would it be great to, to just go ask Andy if we could take it all and bring it to the daughter and dump it on her porch or something, you know? He wanted to do that, but it's not really our job, you know? Um, did try to get him to put it in a bank, though. Yes. Um, my question's also about Andy. It, at one point, he, you see him and he, he just doesn't want to do this anymore. He decides he doesn't want to find the treasure. Right. So I'm wondering if maybe he did find the map. I mean, do you think that at any point did you feel like maybe he did find it and just didn't want to go there and face it? Or did he always know where it was? Yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was an ongoing question. Yeah. I don't think so. But it certainly occurred to us on many occasions. Yeah. Well, it, I could see it in the way that it was edited, that that feeling was there. Yes, so yeah, it was, good. it was definitely there. Um, it was a mystery. It was a real mystery at all moments with Andy. Uh, so this sort of arose out of all that you just said about Andy and the money and the daughter. What do you think the responsibility or responsibilities of a filmmaker are, like uh, being a social anthropologist, watching things happen, and how much do you interfere, how much do you not interfere, what ultimately what tipped the scale uh, and made you decide that you had to call social services? How does that all play out for people who are making factual films, following people's lives around? 
It's a really tricky question. I mean, I think it is the question, and it's a question I love. I love that line. I think the line is everything. You know, the degree to which you engage and then step back, and it's that constant dance that makes a film, I think, and it's not, the idea of a fly on the wall is preposterous. It's not a fly on the wall. Flies don't do anything. It's, you know, you're a person in a room engaging, and if it weren't for the fact that we were filming this, there probably wouldn't be a story, you know? Would have, Daryl have gone to Austria? I don't know, you know? Um, and Lance, I don't know. It was certainly all waiting to happen, you know, but that's the essence of what happens as soon as you raise a camera to something. It changes it, and um, I, you know, I, I had moments when I was filming where I, where I was too present, and I killed something. You know, I killed a moment um, because of my my presence was too strong, and I had other moments where I could have probably stood to, to say more, you know, and to engage more. And I think that, I think it is that that is what I love about this, about making a film, and I think it's the same in a fiction film. You know, to what degree does a director engage with, their, with his actors and when do you step back and allow that, them to make choices of their own? And, you know, that's that fine line. As far as engaging in their lives behind the scenes, that was clear for me. I mean, you know, I watched that... Um, I remember watching a film called Children Underground and uh, it's, a, it's a great documentary, actually. I love the film um, about these kids living homeless on the streets and... There's one scene where the filmmaker is filming a girl getting beaten up. And I'm sorry. I don't care. I mean, I will never do that. You know, I, I just won't. I will not. I, I would chuck my film in the garbage before I watch someone, you know, get hurt in front of me or um, die in front of me in that way that Andy's wife was. She wasn't being taken care of. And... I just felt like it's more important than anything else, you know. She was sitting, you know. She was. It's it's. It was very. It was it was it was really hard to watch because it made me realize, you know, you drive by these houses and they all look the same, and you go in them, and it's unbelievable what's in, inside, you know. You'd never know. You'd never know the suffering that's living just inside these walls, and the elation and everything. Darius, could you talk a little bit more about, because you've been talking about being there with them. You're the cinematographer. There's another cinematographer credited. Most of the time, I gather that you were working solo. Yeah, a lot of it I was working on my own. Um, so, so this is a very intimate um, relationship. Yeah. And um, would it have been different if you had a sound person and a continuity person there? Yeah. Or there, you had two people shooting? Uh, clearly you made a decision. And I don't think it was just because of money. No, no, so yeah, it's a very, a it's a very specific that. decision, absolutely, yeah. I just, I think that the first and foremost for me is, is about intimacy and, and, you know, any amount of... Um, other stuff behind the camera, I mean, it better be really important. I had a sound person once, and that was it. It just, it was very clear to me that, you know, it, it just, it didn't live in the same way. Plus the sound was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I think you sacrifice a lot. You know, you sacrifice polish, there's no doubt at times, um, but it's worth it. You know, absolutely worth it. And I'm also really glad I had two. I had Anson um, in Austria, you know, because we had that two shot in the field. And that would have been a very different scene if we didn't have that. Um, so, you know, there's a time, I think, for, for two cameras. But I think it's a lot about relationships. And you don't, the more Trust. people you have, the less intimate it's probably going to be, you know. Um, it's amazing how you go past these sets in the city all the time, you know, and you see... 500 people and all doing this thing and then you realize they're shooting like a Tic Tac commercial or something and it's like, you know, there's nothing happening. It was unclear to me where Andy was living and Lance and on the other hand, can you tell some other tragic story of Andy that you didn't include in the film? Well, um, 
Andy lived in Arizona and Lance lived in Utah. Um, and, and it was actually very organic the way Lance would travel to Vegas to sell cars. And Andy's house was just another little jaunt down the road from Vegas. So um, it was, that's why he would go so frequently, because he was there anyway. Um, and uh, um, as far as Andy, um, yeah, there were so many stories. Uh, there was the ongoing saga of him and this Japanese man in the war. And, it, and frankly, a lot, and it didn't always make sense. It was hard to, to figure out. It was hard to piece that together. It would come in little bits, you know, in every conversation it would come up. But there were many, many stories, a lot of stories of brutality, a lot of stories of, um, of this beheading, that would, this whole thing about beheading. And apparently, I looked into it a bit, and apparently it was a real, I mean, we all know about the Japanese and the tradition of beheading, but what I didn't really know was that there were also, it was also common, or at least it's documented to some degree, that American soldiers they had such a vehement hatred for the Japanese because they were so, um, well, the Japanese were very brutal, number one, but the campaign against the Japanese uh, was so um, powerful in this country that American GIs would go around and decapitate dead Japanese. It was a... You're kidding me. You're kidding. Wow. Wow, that's unbelievable. I mean, I, uh, I didn't find any pictures. I didn't find any images of that, but I did find... And when he found that, I saw it, he dis it disappeared. I bet. <laughs> I mean, this is, not, this is not the greatest generation that we talk about. But th this is such it's a big war. part of the film. It is war. These are 18-year-old kids. They're all 18-year-old kids. As a matter of fact, that SS, the former SS soldier... Um, he said to me afterwards, and he didn't say a lot, I asked him, you know, I was curious, and my family, I, I come from, you know, Jews who, who were driven out and most killed in the war, um, and he said to me that, you know, when he was 16, they took his father, the Nazis took his father for being a political dissident and forced him into the, into the army, and, and him and his brother, and his life was ruined. And he slightly teared up. He said his entire life was ruined. And it wasn't until that one moment in that field that he felt there was anything worthwhile that had happened in his life from that war. I mean, unbelievable. And so you can imagine. And his family. But and his family, tragic story. Some tragic stories. You want more tragedy, huh? I didn't give you enough. Uh, more tragedy about Andy's family. Well, you know. I mean, I really think that the, the tragedy in Andy's family is, every, is, is pretty clear in the film. I mean, as far as losing a son, uh, you know, he has, there was so much there. I mean, there were, there, even the porn, you know, the pornography was just, it wasn't happy porn. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. It, it, was, it was not good. It was violent. And it, for the reason it's in the film is because it represented this part of Andy that was that was buried and tortured. and tortured, yeah, mm -hmm. and and violent. And you know, he had a wife. I said we. I spoke to him about his first relationship. There was a lot of pain in that. It was a painful life that he led. There's no doubt. Not a lot of happiness. Back there. Well, I th I think Lance is really really interesting, uh, fascinating. I I couldn't. Pinpoint Lance. I mean, there's so many ways in which he intersects with the other two guys and uh, ways in which he reflects them and all that. And then when they got to Austria or to Munich, one or the other, right. and, and they, they're talking, Daryl's talking to a German person, and there's no translator there. Right. And I'm thinking, Daryl, Lance is not serious about this. He, this he is not serious if he doesn't have a translator there. Because they're, it's very funny. I mean, they're talking to each other, and Daryl's going on, you know, with his Utah accent, and the guy can't understand a word he's saying. Right. So I have my 
feelings about Lance's well, what do you, you, seriousness. You, his seriousness. So you, you question his, like, what was he really doing? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's just Lance. I just think, you know, he's... I, flaky. He's flaky, yeah, to a degree in that way. He just wants to go and... Agua Fria. Agua Fria. It was so funny in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Lance. I, you know, there was, a, there was actually a review. Someone reviewed it and said, you know, they didn't even have a translator. You know, it was, a, it was kind of a... Um, but they said they as the, the film crew, you know. And, you know, that's what that came down to, is what, are, are we going to hire a translator for these guys? No way, because I loved that it was the blind leading the blind. That was, the, that was what was so wonderful about it. And I was perfectly happy, and so was Dan Campbell, the, the angel producer, perfectly happy to chase this thing into the middle of nowhere. At one point, actually, we were stuck in a field of Swiss chard in a van. <laughs> it's, it's worth noting. Um, and actually, Daryl drove us out as we pushed. And, you know, so we had the blind man driving us out of this field of Swiss chard. Um, yeah, we made sure to look. You know why we did? Because Daryl said, now what are we stuck in? What's that a field of? You know, he was a farmer. And we were like, hold on a second. It's Swiss chard. Okay, okay. <laughs> the, the, there's a person back there who hasn't had a chance to ask or comment. I was just wondering um, what else do you have going or coming oh, up? Thank you. Um, well, I have um, a couple things going on. I'm actually filming a guy in Las Vegas who is um, preparing for the end of the world right now with his, uh, it's a documentary about a guy preparing for the end of the world with his uh, Native American nephews. And um, it's been a very interesting process. Another somewhat wild journey. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of developing some other things as well. Um, I'm not sure. I have one other project that I won't talk about yet because I'm not sure if I'm going to dive in. Thank but you very much. thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, oh. Rebecca. <laughs> um, so there was f there's a many coincidences and correlations um, that developed towards you know the end of the film. Uh, you know, they kept talking about the end of war, the end of war. And of course, right now, we are engaged in that. So I'm curious um, how, I mean, have, have any current um, soldiers or anybody who's involved in the military or how people have responded to that in terms of the current situation and how we, you know, how we can relate to the past? Yeah, I, I have had um, some interactions about that. And I think for a lot of people, the current war comes up. And, I, and for me, that was why Lance was so important as a character. Obviously, he was not a soldier or anything, but he represents that modern American mindset. And I think it brings, it bring, it, 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 those questions come to mind. And for a lot of people, they do. Um, the parallels with our war now and the lasting qualities that, that, that this war will have on generations to come. Um, I, haven't, uh, I haven't had um, veterans from the Iraq war speak specifically to me about, about their experiences and how it's resonated, but I've had parents of veterans in the Iraq war talk to me. Um, and uh, I, I feel like this film, um, unfortunately, will always be relevant, you know. It's humanity. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a good last word. I think this film always will be relevant. I hope and so. Not just because of the message, because of the way it's made. Well, so thank, thank you. you very much, Darius. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much.